In this episode of TWIP, it's all about mastering the art of Photoshop with Renee Robin. This is TWIP. All right, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about Photoshop, you guessed it, along with a bunch of other things that relate to image processing and post-processing uh, on the computer and how we can make our photography better and how, if you're into it, you might go down the path of Renee Robin to becoming a world-class compositing artist. So. To talk about that is Renee Robin. Renee Robin's here to uh, to let us to open the kimono a little bit and tell us about her <laughs> her process with what regard to, to editing photos. Renee, welcome, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Hey. Thanks for having me back. It's been a while. I know it has been a while. It's good to see you. You look you look fantastic as always. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Thanks for having me. This should be fun. Yeah. Okay. Before we get started, let's just catch up because every now and then I get a message or I see a. a Facebook post or something from you that is uh, you're in some corner of the world like the last one you were knee deep in snow somewhere shooting gladiators or, <laughs> or something. Oh yeah, yeah, what, that what, was two days ago. What, what is going on? Cold. Where where are you now? I'm actually back in Alberta for the first time since you and I have done a TWIP episode since the first one. Wow, really? Yeah. And what what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing out there? Are you shooting? Are you visiting? Are you hanging out? What? Uh, I've been rebuilding my website so. That's just a gigantic job. <laughs> so it just requires being in one spot with access to all the files under the sun. Yeah. So that means being at home. Yeah. I remember, uh, I mean, I want to say it was like two years ago, three years ago. We were having a very similar conversation about you rebuilding your website. <laughs> you were... It's finished now, though. It's actually live. It is live. So what's the URL? So people can go hit it right now. Yeah. If you want to check it out, it's ReneeRobinPhotography.com. Renee Super Robinson. Super unique. <laughs> so go there. So people that are watching this live or whatever, even later, just go go to that site and check it out, and you'll understand. This under is actually the first announcement, the first public announcement of it being live. So really? there you go, Frederick. A TWIP exclusive. <laughs> a TWIP exclusive. So, but seriously, go go check it out because some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about will start making sense in terms of the Renee's workflow and why she put so much effort into what she's doing. So Renee, I want to kick this off. So earlier. Earlier today, actually, so we, um, uh, my buddy uh, Troy Miller and I were recording a Twit Pro photo critique where we were just sort of, you know, shooting the breeze about images and processing, and and the topic came up of is it time to leave Adobe or leave Photoshop because of all the tools that are out there, you know, like Capture One and Affinity Photo and all that stuff. And the, my response was, <clears throat> for a lot of people, yeah, it is. You can you can viably replace Photoshop with other tools, but for another huge group of people, you can't. And, and your name came up as one of those people in terms of you. The the switching costs would be detrimental to the art process, <laughs> right? So you want to elaborate on a little bit? I mean, could you could you theoretically switch away from Photoshop right now if you wanted to? Um, I've looked into a few different programs that are out there, and so far for what I'm doing, there isn't anything that will switch for me yet. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, the other side of it is how much time can I take away to master another program? Right. right. So that I can do what I need to do really, really quickly, really, really efficiently. Yeah. Um, so right now, you know, Photoshop and Capture One are the two animals that I'm using, and I'm using a lot of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and but I am really interested in what's out there because other programs that are coming out are going to be doing different things that Photoshop isn't doing. So maybe instead of it being like, oh, I'm going to replace it, is it's just I'm going to add another program to the wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah. Why does it yeah. we say I say that on Twip all the time. Why do why do photographers always say or when it can very easily just be and right? And yeah, no, have your cake and eat it. Too. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about let's let, I want to use the time wisely. I know you, you got limited time. So let's let's dive in and talk about hardware first. Right. So yeah. that's that's the basis of everything. I whenever I see you, I tease you about your <laughs> computer because and I use the term or your laptop and I use the term laptop loosely because <laughs> It's like it's like a Mission Impossible briefcase <laughs> of a computer, but it's one of it's it could be a desktop easily. So tell me, tell us about your your hardware configuration and why why you're using what you use. Yeah, so I basically have a mobile desktop. Um, I did a job with Intel a few years ago, and uh, we built a custom computer with Puget Systems that didn't 
exist yet, really. Um, so that's cool, but it's been three years since then, and it's had the crap kicked out of it, and I've been running it hard and fast for a long time, for many hours a day. Yeah. Um, but it's got three hard drives in it. It's got 32 gigs of RAM. Um, you know, they're all SSD drives. It's got the graphics processor. I may have made a different decision knowing what software was coming out, but at the time it was the best decision I could make. It's NVIDIA stuff and blah. That shit's all boring. Yeah. <laughs> um, that stuff is all boring. That's fine. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> First <Yeah>. shot of whiskey. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you and I, I, mean, I remember you and I were, uh, God, I forget how long ago it was, but it was a while back and we were in a mall. We went into a, um, you were here visiting for somebody, went into the mall and into the Microsoft store because you were, con you, I think you were considering at the time moving to a Surface tablet. Yeah, I was. Um, and they just can't handle the workflow still. Um, I actually just got a Wacom Mobile Studio Pro, one of the brand new ones, the 16 inch. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's awesome, but it completely changes my workflow. So I use it for making completely different stuff than what I do day to day. Yeah. Um, but even still, with the new technology, it really struggles with the PSB files that I want to run and that I do run. Well, let's talk about that. That's the workflow stuff I want to really dive into. Because I, yeah. I looked over your shoulder once. I think it was at, at um, uh, Smug Mug down. Remember you were at Smug Mug and you were, you were working yeah. on something. One of the Smug Mug films or something. But you, yeah. I think you, were, you had one of, your, one of your projects open. And I mean, I, like me, I'm, I'm a Photoshop newbie compared to you. And I, and I may have created a document that had 20 layers in it at one time. 20 layers is like you just getting started. You had something with like 60 layers or something ridiculous like that in it. Yeah, they break the 100 layer thing pretty often. Like why? Like tell me what's going on there. What's the workflow? Like do you have Indecision okay, a layer for an on. eyeball, a layer for an <laughs> eyelash, or like what? <laughs> how, how does that yeah, work? Indecision is usually what causes a huge amount of layers. <laughs> 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 particularly with color grading <laughs> yeah. um, you know, or I'll make like one group with a file where you know like this is the placement of the article of the items and then I'll make another group where it's the other one I just alternate back and forth and I eventually delete one or whatever <laughs> yeah so um, it's just sort of a track it's 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 your layers yeah. are you moving down the path to to what the final image is going to be yeah exactly yeah it's just like chaos <laughs> But it, um, but it works. It works. So it works for me. I don't recommend it for everyone. But you know the beautiful thing about Photoshop and post processing is it's always just about finding what works for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be what works for everyone else. Sometimes other people have really good ideas, and you're like, oh, I never thought of that before, and it changes everything. And other times you look at it, you try it, and you're like, no, nah, no, nah, it doesn't really work for me right now. But maybe in maybe in two or three years, right? So. I mean, is that is that what you recommend to people that are trying to get get their brain around Photoshop? Because Photoshop is a hydra. Right. I mean, it could it could yeah, be man. many. Right. Them. It could be many different things. It does everything from 3D to video editing to compositing to on yeah. and on and on. And most people, myself included, only use a small sliver of that. You use a lot more of it, but probably not not all of it. If someone's jumping into photography or even compositing right now, mm -hmm. would you guide them towards Photoshop? as sort of the industry standard or would you say you know you know forego the creative cloud subscription and go go in another direction what would your advice be i would ask first what they want to do with the images so i mean if people who are this is kind of the the stages that i recommend um and it depends on how technologically literate the user is so let's say we have somebody who is older and they're really not comfortable with computers they're really not comfortable with technology then i'm going to say like go with some like really simple programs for image editing, right? If yeah. you're just going to be pushing some sliders, I hate saying it because I don't like the program at all, but if they are really uncomfortable with editing, then Lightroom is probably a pretty good one, Yeah. right? I haven't done spent any time in Affinity, so I don't have an opinion on that. But for people who are really, really, really uncomfortable with technology, that's often a good place to start. Yeah. People who are more, you know, advanced, or comfortable with learning new technology, then I would say go with Capture One first if you're not wanting to get into like into um, compositing, right? Because they they you know they're now doing layering. Um, their adjustments are super specific. The engine is getting extremely powerful, and the raw the raw converter is incredible. Yeah. You know, I would say like you know C Capture One is a bit of a bear of a program to learn, but it's still extremely powerful. And then if you're wanting to get into layer mask, or if you're wanting to get into layer masking and big composites then yeah for sure like jump into photoshop but i don't think 
there is any one right answer. I mean, I got into Capture One after I was, you know, well proficient in Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's the, that's the question. Even even I, you know, I've been using Photoshop since version two, and you know, I legendary. I, <laughs> I've been pre, using it since pre layers. You know, see the gray hairs. In there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've been but since- but I I think about it, and I think you know, I I want to look at these other apps, but then I I I keep being drawn back to Photoshop because it it feels like okay. I want something that's gonna, I'm never going to outgrow, right? And I, yeah. f- I feel like if I, if I become better and better and a superhero at using Photoshop, then, you know, I'm gonna be good. I, I can, yeah, I can go to some of these other apps later and play around, but if I'm good at Photoshop, it's kinda, kinda like when you're, you're a teenager or whatever and you're writing your resume, and they're like, yeah, you gotta have Microsoft Office on there. You know, Photoshop feels yeah. like the Microsoft Office of the creative world. Do you, do you agree with that? Photoshop, Photoshop is, like, is like your old girlfriend that you keep going back to that like, you know, it's a little bit codependent and it's kinda weird, but yet you're always just kinda there for each other even if you try and see other things. <laughs> that's what photoshop is for me <laughs> that is, that is I, I titled this episode wrong codependency codependency in photoshop <laughs> uh, good analogy very very i think most of us in the audience can can uh, understand that that was really good uh, I, started doing, I started doing um in my lectures uh breakdowns of photoshop files that don't work out and i equate it to like a really bad relationship where like me and photoshop are in the kitchen and we're just fighting and screaming at each other and nothing's working out and then eventually we take a break and we walk away and we come back to it later and we're like okay we can work on this like all right yeah, I know. I still care about you too. You know, we can we can make this work. And then like a, a good image, you know, comes out a couple of days later. But it, you got to go through the cycle of like hating each other for a little bit. That's yeah. me in Photoshop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Photoshop is just always there. Like they just you just call and it's like, what's up? Until you do an update, and that's when they go cra- crazy. Right. Like 2019 right now, I've watched everyone exploding over these updates, and I'm just like, Photoshop's in a bad place right now. I'm just gonna throw chocolate at it and leave the room. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> Come back in a couple months. <laughs> that's, that's classic. That's classic. See, are you, see, I can see where your mind is at. See, the you, people that are watching this are getting to know the Renee I know. You're like, you know, like the, the nerd that is trapped in the graphic design and, and Photoshop compositing world, and you got a foot in cool and nerd at the same time. <laughs> I think it's all a matter of opinion. <laughs> but, but, okay, so let, so workflow wise, so you're so back to the layer piece of it. So I want to I want to make sure we put a, put a pin in that. So the when you when you look at this from the standpoint of you need the horsepower of that giant massive desktop computer with a handle on it to get that to get your work done tank roller bag but yeah. is that is that <laughs> is that a factor of you being inefficient and i say that with 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 you know Can adoration you know, um, because you you said your workflow is like, okay, I, you know, I'm ADD. I want to put a layer here for this. Okay, now I need another layer for that versus some people that will be more sort of structured in their workflow, thereby needing less horsepower. Like, how do, what, what's your recommendation? Should people throw horsepower at it and then just play around in that horsepower or should they be more methodical with their workflow? Well, I would say both, but I do think that the most frustrating thing is being limited by your technology. I mean, you yeah. want the limiting factor to be you, not your gear. Right. So, I mean, I have a lot of clients where I have to build big, big, big images and they're just like many, many, many megapixels wide and tall and they have to print really big. And I got to go to a lot of places all over the world and it has to look perfect. Well, that's just big files. Like I did some stuff with a 5 DSR file and that was massive. Like I thought working on, yeah. you know, 21 megapixel files or 23 megapixel files made big PSB files. And then you're working on a 5 DSR file. It's massive, and like my computer struggled with it, and it's no slouch. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, okay. Then that that begs the question: If you're you're creating these giant files, well, what's the average file size of one of these massive documents you're working with? Um, I don't usually make something less than six gigs. A six gigabyte file. Okay. So how do you handle backup and retrieval and all that stuff? You're not Tons pushing stuff up to the cloud, drive. especially on a, no, God, on no, the hotel Wi-Fi, the right? Yeah. No. No. Just lots of hard drives. Okay. Um, yeah, I just like go home. So when I'm traveling, I have a couple hard drives. That's the other reason why there's three hard drives in the computer. So there's always one backup there and then another backup on a separate drive that's hidden elsewhere. Love it. Love <laughs> or mailed home or whatever needs to be done. Or I'll just like buy another drive because I mean, data drives are cheap right now. Yeah. Right. I mean, I can get a two terabyte drive for a couple hundred dollars or, or less. I can get it probably for a hundred dollars, copy everything over, mail it home. You know, that's easy. Yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah, have you ever have you ever lost data? Uh, I've lost some. I actually, it's uh, my internal drive on this computer that we're using right now. My third drive is failing because it's just too hot all the time. Yeah. Um. So I lost I lost one folder. Wow. Yeah, that's not bad. Sucked, but it was fortunately a shoot that I could actually reshoot. It was one of the few shoots that I hadn't backed up right away. Yeah. Um, because I was photographing my friend's cat for a personal project, so I was like, "Oh, it's a cat. It'll be fine." And then I went and loaded up the computer one day, and it was just like, "Oh, hold on, I got this present for you. It's blue, and it's <laughs> a blue screen, and we're gonna give you all these errors." And I was like, "No, it's two in the morning. I'm gonna spend the next thirteen hours trying to fix this." Um, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I went and bought another hard drive and backed up everything that I could, but I did lose, I did lose one folder, but fortunately I was just able to reshoot it, which is really, really lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's, it, I mean, it could have been something that I couldn't, couldn't have done. That sounds amazing. Not having, you know, lost more, uh, but you know, I haven't lost that much either, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the whole hard drive space keeps changing in terms of portable hard drives being cheaper and cheaper and you know the but bandwidth is not really keeping up with that so being able to get your if you keep creating six gigabyte files and trying to get them uploaded on a hotel wi-fi is probably a non-starter it's not happening yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not happening. So I want to yes. I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Just I want to backtrack and talk about workflow a little bit more in terms of your your worldview per se mm -hmm. on on how you you look at the your travels and all this and you are inspiring to me from the standpoint of you you go to certain places and you i mean you're multitasking in lots of places when you travel but you're looking at textures you're looking at clouds you're looking at patterns and you're capturing them with the eye that you're going to composite them or you, you may or may not use them in a later composite and sometimes you even go places just to capture a particular texture you want to talk about that a little bit and and what your what your mindset is with regard to capturing the world for later use yeah um, a friend of mine said it kind of eloquently and i thought it was really funny but it works really well he said uh, he said that i was like a treasure hunter yeah <laughs> and i'm just like running around the planet kind of like picking up little pieces of treasure and just like sticking them in my bag like a little ferret you know or a squirrel <laughs> but, you know and i'm just like i'll take all of these and I'm going to put them in a bag and I'm going to hold on to them forever. And I'm like dragging around this gigantic Santa Claus bag of, of you know, pieces. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And then you use them later, right? It's like you're, you're, yeah, you're traveling, gathering clip used. art. Exactly. Some stuff doesn't get used for like five or six years. And then all of a sudden a job comes along and I'm like, I have the thing. I can do the thing. Exactly the thing that you're looking for. Um, you know, it's not too often I have to reach out and ask for help from other photographers, which I'm more than willing to do if I need to, but um, it's so much easier when you just own all the copyright to all your own content if you're making composites. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that being said, though, like there's lots of sites out there that are doing free stuff, like Pixabay and a bunch of others, and that's great. That's awesome, um, at least for digital artists. Yeah. But it's not always high res enough. You know, sometimes I need the raw files because I'm going to be pushing everything quite far. Yeah. Well, where, do, where do your ideas come from? You know, as people sort of look through the gallery, so I'll, I'll put a gallery of your images in the uh, the blog post on thisweekinphoto.com of, of some of your images, or people can just go to renerobinphoto.com and I'll put the links to everything. Yeah, yeah. And so people can head over there and check out your stuff. But how much of that stuff is self-assigned and how much is it is commissioned work for clients? And where in the for the self-assigned stuff, where do those ideas come from? Like your mind is dark, Renee. It's very dark. <laughs> <laughs> not that dark. It's not that bad. Um, honestly, a lot of it just comes from dreaming. Really? So you wake up. Yeah. You'll wake up and and say, "Oh wow, let me sketch and write a note and then make it." Or well, yeah, because like I'll. <laughs> this is really pathetic, um, which shows a lot of where my head is at all the time. Uh, as I will sleep, and I will dream the PSD file. <laughs> See, isn't that isn't that isn't that gross? You see, what, you see what <laughs> I mean gross. about having one foot in geek and one foot in cool. See, most it's pretty. I'm gonna say, gross. you know, most that's that codependency thing with Photoshop. See, most most people I, that I, I know of don't dream in layers. <laughs> yeah, I know. I will like I'll have an editing problem, like a project that I've been working on for like sometimes a couple years, and I'll and then you know, like the girl jumping off the building with the little wings. You know, that one that went all over the place a few years back. Uh, that was sleeping on an airplane. I'd been trying to think on how to do that shot for months and then I was sleeping and then I dreamed about how to do it and I woke up and I was like, oh my God, that's it. And I wrote it all down Yeah. and then I went and did it, right? But 
I find my conscious brain is too dumb. <laughs> so the subconscious is smarter than I am. So it's just yeah. Welcome, Kinda welcome to the that. welcome to the human condition. What, a, yeah, right? <laughs> what about what about uh, you know? So there's there's the idea of, of dreaming up something and then executing on it. What about when the client comes to you and they're like, you know, we want this, this, and this, and you're like, that's crap. I don't know if I want to do that. No, do you? How do you how do you draw the line between I could really use that big bag of money versus I'm not going to compromise and create your crap for you. I'm sure you've had those requests before. How do you handle that? I've had a, I've had a couple jobs that come to mind that were pretty cringeworthy. Um, so on one hand, you make the decision like, okay, is paying the rent or putting some money into savings or whatever my priority today? Or is like my quote unquote artistic integrity the thing that's important today? And mm -hmm. I kind of just like make that decision. Um, Based on how hungry get... you are at the time? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm never going to say no to anything. I'm never going to say yes to something that I'm morally against, right? Yeah, like, I'm yeah. never going to do anything that is, you know, promoting violence or anything like that. Like, that's not, obviously, I'm not going to compromise on that. But, uh, you know, if somebody has, like, a boudoir idea that they want, and I don't shoot a lot of boudoir, it's, it's not very common. Yeah. Um, but let's say I get a boudoir request, and, uh, you know, maybe the request is a little odd and I'm pretty liberal, but every now and then you get a question where you're like, that kind of costume, like, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, because I also try not to judge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the challenge, the challenge comes out is, uh, the really hard ones are when they have a really specific idea and I think I can make it work and then we shoot it and then I get into editing and I'm like, nope this is not working this does not work i thought it would work and it doesn't work and so oftentimes then what i'll do and i've only had to do this twice um where i'll i'll reshoot the client and i'll say like look this is what it's looking like i realize that you probably think this is okay but i think that we can do this and it'll be way better okay. so like for example um I don't know if you guys, I don't know if anybody's seen uh, the mermaid photos where she's all tied up lately mm -hmm. going around the internet. Those went everywhere. So uh, her and I had worked together before on another concept and, you know, she came to me with the idea and I was like, yeah, this is awesome. You know, we'll shoot it, we'll edit it and I'll get it back to you. Um, and literally many months have gone by since we did that shoot and I would keep working at it, keep working at it. And I'm just like, this is not working. Like I thought how we shot it it would work and so finally I just called her up and I was like what do you say about doing another shoot and I was like you know I'll cover whatever we'll just do it in like a, a trade basis or whatever it is um you know this is the idea that I have and then sure enough like you know everyone got super excited got like a huge team together for it um and like really proud of the work you know and it looks really you know i love it i think it turned out really really nicely i'm st i still haven't given up on the other concept because the other concept was really good but i'm missing a puzzle piece somewhere in my head to make it work so mm -hmm. i'm just going to keep marinating on it you know for however long it takes until finally it's like there's the thing i was missing well how does so. that how does that work that's a, that's a good segue because you 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 we were trading texts a while ago and you were saying that you had just gone through your portfolio, I guess in preparation for the relaunch of the website and had redone most, if not all of the images. How does that work? I mean, how do you, cause the images, I mean, before you redid them, they look great. Now they look fantastic still, but how do you, yeah. like, where does your mind go when you're like, you know what? I'm just going to go redo all that. <laughs> I'm just going to redo all that work. How does that happen? And how do you execute on that? Well, because I, I liked the work that I did before. The photography and the lighting was good enough, but the digital art wasn't good enough. Um, I didn't think anyways. I figured it could be improved upon. I was like, I have like eight more years of experience since I've done a lot of these shoots. Mm -hmm. What happens if I apply, you know, this brain now to the photography back then? Like a lot of that stuff was shot on like a 5D Mark One or some of it, a Nikon D80. So I would love to see who can argue with me, which camera it was a shot on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not until you start printing it pretty big, you're probably not going to notice. Um, so this, but, this I mean, does this mean total, in ten in years, total, in five, ten years, you're going to redo everything again, or maybe I don't know. Yeah. I I just always just kind of leave it open to that. I mean, I re-edited, I did a mass upload, um, and I've done more since then. But I did a mass upload, and it was 255 re-edits. Wow. And that took me three and a half months. 
Jeez. And I didn't use them all. I didn't use them all. Like I sent all the updated edits that I did to everyone. Like anyone who was involved in the projects, I was like, hey, here you go. Here's a present, surprise. Like none of us look like this anymore, but I hope you like it. Um, and so that was actually, it was actually also really cathartic yeah. <laughs> to go back and be like, wow, you know, some of my ideas didn't totally suck. They just weren't finished, yeah. you know? And so then I go like, well, what's going to happen in another 10 years? Like, what am I going to be doing then? Am I going to even look at this stuff? Am I going to be doing a completely different career? I don't know, but... Yeah, which also you know, which, which also means that you, you've kept the layered Photoshop files of all of your work and you're able to go back in and open it up and, and continue working. So you, you keep everything. So all your yeah. work, all the assets that, that went into them, they're all... You, you could go back to, you know, five years ago and re-edit things. So should Ten people do ago, that? Yeah. If people if people are editing and they're, they're into the, the con compositing game, should they keep that layered Photoshop file? Or That's totally up to you. I mean, that's up to every single person who yeah. wants to be a creator. I mean, for me, I just chose to. Um, I think I had lost a hard drive once, like way back when, but it was work that I don't even remember. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm yeah. like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that was just my decision to have copies of everything. I yeah. mean, I'm always I'm always paranoid of like, you know, well, what happens if like there's a fire or a third world war or whatever, you know, I'm like, oh, but all these things. And like, if I have enough stuff in enough places, like a little squirrel, I'm just like stash this stuff everywhere. Yeah. Something's probably going to survive. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, Renee, so one of, one of the things I want to talk to you about um, is... So you're you're an ambassador for for Capture One, right? And mm -hmm. I want yeah. I want to know what that means, and I also want to know I've been hearing like over the in, an increasing chorus of people singing the praises of Capture One, not so much some of them in, in you know complete opposition to Lightroom, like Lightroom I don't want to use it anymore. This is this is the grown up version of Lightroom or whatever, and some people just use it because they say it has better raw processing. Some people like the UI. Once and for all, settle it for the people, I don't know, the 100 people or whatever that are watching this. Once and for all, settle it. Why is Capture One, from the ambassador's mouth, one of the ambassador's mouth, why is Capture One superior and why should I give it a shot? So for me, the reason why I love Capture One is a different answer than what most people who work as an ambassador for Capture One think that it's awesome. Uh, for me, Capture One has this amazing feature for a composite artist this is the best thing on the face of planet Earth as far as processing goes. Um, and genuinely, like this is the reason why I said that I would stand behind this program because it has a feature called overlay. So you shoot tethered and you shoot um, um, to the computer, right? So then you can see the poses and whatever else coming up on the screen, but there's an overlay feature. So if you have your background pre-made or even just like loosely sketched out, you can put it over top of your subject while you're shooting so that you match your lighting and your perspective and your camera lens and your distortion perfectly. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. Everyone else is like, oh my God, the rock inverted the detail and the, like, the selective stuff and the blood and the colors and like it does all that stuff great. But it has this layer function and it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then other people's, you know, people will say, yeah, it's amazing for that, but you know the the user interface might be t is too complicated lightroom is easy i know there's a develop module and there's some sliders over there capture one you get in there and it's a little more intimidating like what, what do you say to those people should they just suck it up and learn it or stay in lightroom well i mean it all depends on what you want to do once again right so i like um I like the usability in Capture One. I like the way everything can move around. I like the way that you can make it work how you want it to work. So kind of like the way Photoshop does, right? There's a way to make Photoshop work for every single brain. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to make Capture One work for every single brain, but you gotta get in there and you gotta get your hands dirty for a little while, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's so many tutorials out there. There's so much free content mm -hmm. for how to get good at Capture One. Um, it's it's astounding. Like there isn't even like oh you have like behind a paywall like it doesn't really exist. Yeah. Right. So. So would you is that is that the suggestion you would make for folks? I mean you know because photography is one of the fastest growing hobbies at least in the United States. I don't know if the world, but at least in the United States. And and you know there's always a new influx of people coming in that are want to learn and they want to try different genres and all that stuff. 
the 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 conventional wisdom changes from year to year on how they should start. So, what would your advice be? So, if someone comes to you and say, "Hey, Renee, you know, I, I love what you do. I want to get started in compositing. I want to be like you. I want to travel the world and capture textures everywhere <laughs> and start." I don't here. recommend that to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I really don't recommend but it to anybody. <laughs> in terms of the software choice. Like, yeah. should, what, what's the software choice? Should it be, you, would you say, dude, just jump into Photoshop and learn that? Or would you say, jump into Lightroom if you're a beginner? Or would you say, capture one and Photoshop for sure? Or what? What's, what's the right solution to, to the newbie that's getting in, that's serious about this, that wants to get really good in five years? How should they be starting here in 2018, 2019? Well, here's the thing about any newbie who's actually serious. It doesn't matter. Mm. Any anybody who wants it bad enough is going to figure it out their own way, and nothing's going to stop them. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's it's everyone else who's like who's like you know, oh I want the easiest way, I want the fastest way, I want the whatever. That's fine. You know, we can make suggestions all day long, and you can choose whichever one you want. You know, I could say like, oh yeah, capture one is amazing, and then you like save that as a tiff, and then hop into Photoshop, and you can hop back and forth, and it's awesome and whatever. Um, but like, let's be honest, the person who really, really wants this stuff isn't going to be asking questions. They're going to be sitting their boots on the ground figuring it out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's like the person that really, really wants to be a photographer is not going to obsess over getting the latest Nikon Zine 7 or something. They're going to be like, you know what, what, what do I have around? What can I use? A phone? I'm going to use that and, and, and shoot with it. So There's like an amazing documentary photographer in Russia who shoots everything on an iPhone and a camera right now. And I definitely can't pronounce it or spell it properly. But his work is amazing. It is so good. And he's probably just editing it using like Snapseed or whatever iPhone app. Yeah. Um, if your work is good, especially with the kind of technology that's out there today with cameras, you can't tell me, you know, it's the camera yeah. anymore. I mean, I went back and re-edited my entire catalog down to my Nikon D80 and my Canon PowerShot G11. Wow. Tell me which ones those were. That's crazy. The power shot. I remember that. I had a G9. I miss. I miss my little G9. Yeah. That's yeah, how I started I on YouTube with up. that little black G9. I love that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. So like that's that's the thing, right? Is it's just like find a tool, whatever's within your means. If you can afford a twenty thousand dollar lens, awesome. Go afford a twenty thousand dollar lens. Yeah. If you can't, then that's also fine. Like whatever you have, if it's in here and you want it bad enough, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about that on This Week in Photo a lot, and that's the, the, the idea that some, some people get, get stuck in that quicksand of gear, right? It's like, I got to have the gear, I got to have this, and oh, no, the, the so-and-so manufacturers come out with, the, with another whatever, and I have to have that. And, they, and some people tend to start using that as an excuse, and I'm not immune to that, but you, you'll start using that as an excuse not to shoot. Like, if, hey, I could, I could be like Renee Robin if I had that Mission Impossible briefcase com computer she has, <laughs> That's right? right? When it's not true. I mean, you, like, like you just said, yeah. you could probably, you will still be Renee Robin if you, all you had was your phone and Snapseed to, to edit. Well, with, have, right? you, have you seen what those kids are doing on Mextures? Like those composite guys with like all the layers and everything? Like they're doing that stuff on their phone. Yeah. Like, come on. I yeah. mean, like, yeah, like there's things that, you know, I've been doing some shooting lately and I've been borrowing a 70 to 200. Am I thinking about buying one now? Yes. Am I going to buy it new? No, I'm going to get something used because all my gear that I've owned, apart from my computers, although even most of those were used, most of the stuff I get secondhand because I just need a tool to work. Yeah. I don't really care if it's new. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I love that. I love that mindset. I mean, because that, that's what, like whenever you and I talk and, you know, we've been we've been talking for, for years and years. Um, it's always refreshing to hear people you and like you and of your ilk talk because it's more about the work than it is about the gear, right? And and more and more am I seeing this sort of separation of oil and water in the industry of people that, and there's nothing wrong with being as excited about the latest gear, the latest lens, if that's your thing, you know, you want to just get that latest drone, whatever. That's awesome, you know, if you can yeah, do totally it. Yeah, that. If that's your thing, do it. If that's yeah. your thing, who cares, right? If you want to yeah. have, a, have a shelf full of cameras and lenses, and that's awesome. But then on the other side, and I learned this when I was hanging out in Puerto Rico with the RGG EDU guys, we were interviewing all these um, commercial artists and photographers and the one thing i noticed that was similar between all of them versus a lot of the people that we talked to on on twip is very rarely did the topic of what camera they used come up or 
or what, you know, that kind of stuff. It was more about, hey, I'm working on this project and I'm trying to get this thing and I'm trying to use some paper mache to try to get this look, you know, that kind of thing versus the, the tool, the paintbrush or the canvas. Yeah. It was more about the idea and the execution. And do you feel that way? Like you, you like it's, it's more about the art itself than it is about the hardware? Or do you think they're like kind of one begets the other? Like you can't do a lot of this stuff without the right hardware. How do you how do you come in on that? There's a compromise, of course, right? I mean, like, there's always the ideal of, you know, it would be great to have, to shoot some of this stuff on, you know, the latest medium format, whatever. But I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy's name is Asher Svizensky or something. I'm, if he's watching this, I'm sorry, I just butchered your name. <laughs> um, he He's a photographer in, um, he's Israeli and Russian, I believe. And, uh, so he's like this weird mix and he's like grim and very like big beard and goes out into the wilderness and photographs super remote stuff. Uh, he did uh, the National Geographic cover of the Eagle Hunters, the girl, one of the young girl Eagle Hunter. Um, that's his photo, you know, and his, <laughs> I actually did ask him the gear question because I was like, you know, his presentations were amazing. His photography is awesome. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, the cover of National Geographic, the photo's soft. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> is that what he says, really? Like, <laughs> come at me um <laughs> but i mean he was using like a, a second hand like really really old you know extremely beat up 1dx you know and some of like my favorite photos of his that he did was um some mining communities up in northern mongolia like really not easy to get to you know it's pure noise and you know even the focus is question about the story and the images like you just look at it and you're just captivated by it like I don't care if the eyelashes are in focus. Like, the, like I am so enthralled with the work. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I had, I did actually have to ask because I was just like, the, like he was shooting in such difficult lighting conditions. I was like, how are you doing this? And he's like, I'm pushing the ISO as hard as that sensor is going to go and further. Yeah. And it's horrible. And I was like, cool. <laughs> That's sweet. You know, and he's like, yeah, these photos aren't very good. And I was like, they're amazing photographs. Like these are examples of what photography is supposed to be pushing you know, it, like, pushing it to its limits yeah because exactly. uh, because of, because of the vision that you're trying to get one of the things that also strikes me about your work Renee is all of your photos I was going to say most of but I can actually correct that all of your photos um, have story behind them right you're you're telling stories in the photo even the girl jumping off the building with the wings the angel wings and all that there's a story even if it's not literal you can like kind of make it up in your head versus okay, here's a shot, a long exposure shot of a pier in black and white, you know, or whatever. There's, there's, there's something going on in there. Is that, that conscious? Are you, do you have like all these storylines in your head, either or in your dreams that you have to make real somehow? Where, like, how does that work? I mostly just like to write enough of a story to get someone's brain writing their own story. Mm. I don't want to tell people what to think or how to think, which speaks on a lot of levels. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not interested in, in telling people, you know, like, oh, this is this is my like emotional state over like blah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, eh, I don't really care. I mean, like if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that in my blog. You know, you wanna know about what I think and how I feel, read the words that I write. It's not necessarily in the photographs. I find for the stuff that I make, because I'm not representing reality ninety percent of the time, right? Um, you know, it it is some form of you know, and the word is used a lot, like blended fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that people make more interesting stories than I can. So like, there's, there's an old, old image that I did, also one of the re-edited ones, uh, with uh, Little Red Riding Hood, and she's got the blonde wig and, you know, this white dress, and her hands are like this with the red hood, and there's, like, blood and gore all over her dress. It's one of the few, like, really gory images loose i mean the gore hounds are like gore haha <laughs> that was cute mm -hmm. um but you know it's one of the more like gore-esque themed images that i've done and uh i have sold that's one of my best-selling prints by far which is surprising um <laughs> you know as i've sold like a lot of especially at conventions but everyone tells me a different story nobody has told me the same story twice and i always thought that was so interesting because when i made it i was just like oh we got this white dress he's got the red hood and i'm like Little, I called it Little Red's Bad Day, and that was that was it. Like I didn't put anything more to it than that. And everyone tells me, you know, these like grandiose, like sometimes it's a simple story, and sometimes it's just like crazy complex, you know, thing that starts off somebody's short story writing. And I always thought that was really cool, so I always try to make sure that 
whenever I'm making something, there's just enough to get someone's brain started so that they can write something that is important to them. I like that. See, that that is a perfect answer to that question. So you're 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 looking at your work kind of as you know, those you ever seen those things where people like I forget what they call them, but they'll go a, a month and someone will write a chapter of a book and then the next person will take the next chapter and then they'll keep going. You ever seen that? I mean, it's like when they... When no, they... I just remember the stories around a circle where everyone's like, oh, you tell the same sentence yeah. and they get back to you. And it's like, it's like, I like cats. And you get back like, you know, Dumbo's a flying elephant. You're like, what? That's not at all what I said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, totally. No, I, I love that stuff. This is, this is cool. So if you continue this sort of mindset around process and, and where these stories come from, when you, when you look at your work, how, how and this is any having spoken to you before i think i know the answer to this already but i'm gonna i'm gonna put it out there anyway um for the audience but how would you categorize yourself as an artist like in terms of genre you know some people say oh renee yeah she's a she's a photographer and some people say no renee is a compositing artist who specializes in fantasy no renee is you know she does where where would you put yourself if any place on that rainbow of of genres I have never had an answer for that. I mean, if you go to my website, there is a digital art section, there is a big wave surfing section, there is a, you know, slightly sexy bodies section, um, you know, where it's like it's fitness and, and boudoir and all this other kind of stuff. And then there's landscape as well. And, 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 I mean, everyone's like, oh, pick a brand and stick to it. And then I'm like, when I was building the website, I was actually really torn and I sent out like a huge body of work to a bunch of friends that I, opinions that I trust. And I was like, how do I categorize this stuff? I don't know. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, you know, just like find that one thing and stick to it and like dial in on it, which I agree on. But at the same time, I get paid for all that work. Um, so then why not showcase it on my website? So I actually still don't know how to categorize what I'm doing, which is probably a gigantic hindrance, but at the same time, I just try to do everything that I put my hands on as best as I can. Yeah, no, so. that's a that's a good answer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, you know the answer. It hasn't changed. I haven't I haven't come to some like big epiphany yet. No. Um, working on it. That would be nice if I was able to be like, yeah, I do this. You know, like some photographers are like, oh, I'm a sports photographer, and I'm like, well, I do that too sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's two more things. Look, we're almost out of time. We're almost at the top of the hour. And I still want to get to the Q&A. Um, there's two more things I want to talk about. Um, the first, we talked about Capture One a bit. So, you know, that's awesome. And I'm going to, there's some questions in here about Capture One that I'll, I'll bring in. Um, but the, the other question is, uh, looking at your website, your newly launched as of, t you know, this week in photo, week. exclusive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep. But looking at your website, you relaunched it on Smug Mug versus some other platforms like Squarespace or WordPress or, you know, fill in the blanks. What was your thought process? Why why Smug Mug? And I love Smug Mug. I have a Smug Mug account and I love Flickr. Yeah. So what, what what was the thought process behind that? Well, because I was using both. I had Smug Mug was running my print shop and like all my client galleries and everything like that. And then I had a WordPress site. And uh, the reason behind that was because Smug Mug's blogging system isn't great. Mm -hmm. um, but I also am not a t I'm not the person who does a ton of blogging and so I thought about it and this is over several years um, I was like well you know I should really just like consolidate them together so what does that look like you know so I sat down with one of the designers and then like a, a lot of friends who build websites whose opinions I trust and I was like how do we make this look good? How do we make this work together? Um, because it's so nice being able to build my client galleries with all of their work. And then if they want prints, they just go like they click through, they order, they buy it, shows up. Yeah. You know, um, even with like digital downloads, you know, for commercial licensing, I can set the prices and then they can download the file that is the accurate size for that license. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's it streamlines so, so much. Um, the blogging is a workaround, but. I mean, I blog twice a year, if that, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> well, you microblog. You're on, you're on social media you're doing mi the microblogging thing versus yeah. the articles, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The articles for me are like a really long process. I'll work on those for like, you know, six or eight months in my head. The same thing as a Photoshop file. I work on writing the same way. I'll write the article in my head for months and months and months. And then it'll just like hit me one day and then I'm awake for two days and I just like spit this thing out. And the same thing happens with me with personal projects in Photoshop. Wow, that's that's cool. So it's just like that's always cooking in the back of my mind, and I'm like, what can I sleep? I don't know. 
<laughs> that's that's the true artist though right that's the that's the true it's artist the, the tortured artist like i have to i'm gonna cut an ear off because i gotta get this thing out been there sometimes i don't recommend it you know people are like i want the full-time creative artwork i'm like no you just want to be happy making artwork and running through the field and daisies all the time it's what we all want <laughs> Because right. you're doing it for a living, that's what it is. <laughs> Renee, the, one of, the other thing that I'm, I want to talk to you about, and I talked to Aaron Nace at Flurn about this as well, um, and that's that's the the addiction or reliance on Wacom tablets, right? Mm -hmm. And I know, and let, let me frame this because I know some photographers, like uh, a photographer I interviewed a couple of years ago. Her name's Rebecca Goodlifstadter. She lives in Iceland. She does, you know, multiplicity shots, self-portraits, that kind of thing. Amazing stuff. And she does it all on a, or she used to, I don't know if she's upgraded now, but she do it all on a crappy old, late, old model MacBook Pro and all her editing was on the trackpad. And I mean, she was doing, by the, by, when everything was said and done, she was doing ad campaigns for Volkswagen and all these different companies on that same little computer without a yeah, tablet. Sure. You and Aaron and other people that I've talked to, swear by the tablet they need the pressure sensitivity all this stuff tell me what your mind process is behind that tablet and why you need it okay well here's the other thing is i don't actually ever need it either i mean i love using it um but i actually give myself every like four weeks or something a trackpad challenge and i actually i actually edit <laughs> see that's the nerd in you coming out the nerd. <laughs> I actually edit a ton of stuff on my trackpad. So like if I'm not doing detailed masking, if I don't have to pull out my Wacom tablet and I can actually just edit from bed with the computer on my lap with like a, like, you know, 76 hard drives scattered on different pillows. Um, you know, if I don't, if I don't need to load up the full system, I won't. Um, yeah. but I mean, I've been to those like just big jobs where there's like super detailed masking where I need it. But I mean, if I'm just going through, and doing, um, like, let's say, for example, we did uh, the horse shoot this weekend with all the, like, knights in armor and stuff like that. You know, I shot a, I shot a ton of stuff that was just, like, behind the scenes, like, hey, memories for everyone who came out, right? Like, I don't need my Wacom for that. I mean, I can, I can literally just, like, push sliders in Capture One and then go into Photoshop and just do, like, a little bit of whatever it is I need to do. Yeah. And it's done. Um, but I love the Wacom for the, for the pressure sensitivity. I mean, since I got the... The Wacom Mobile Studio Pro, that is awesome. I mean, I love my my Wacom. I have an into into a, uh, one of the new ones. It's a medium, but it's a size small of what it used of what the previous Intuos version was, and it's a small. Mm -hmm. um, and I have that mapped down to like a couple inches so that I'm not damaging my joints anymore. So because I do so much editing, I was blowing out, I was destroying my elbow, my wrist, and my shoulder. Yeah. So I mapped it down so like I can go across the screen by just these tiny, tiny, tiny micro movements, which is super handy. Um, but for when I'm doing like, let's say any digital illustration, like that Wacom Mobile Studio Pro to draw on is so smooth and so nice. And I, wow. I love it, but I do notice right away that, you know, within a couple of days of using it all day, my shoulder is like, Hey, can you stop? Cause I mean, I destroyed my right shoulder in an accident when I was a teenager. Um, and you know, doing a bunch of other stuff just being dumb so my shoulder is, is a weak point and so I have to know like I know when to draw that line yeah you know so I can work on the mobile studio pro for a few hours a day but then I'm back on like the little the editing tablet after that um, but the pressure sensitivity especially for doing illustration and like really detailed masking is brilliant it's so nice love it love it yeah. all right well cool let's let's uh let's move right along I want to move into um the Q and A segment. We've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to dive in and take some questions from the live viewers. Uh, by the way, folks, if you're in the chat room, go ahead and post, of a me post us a, a message if you want to ask Renee a question, and give us a thumbs up, a like, you know, so that uh, you know, give the This Week in Photo channel some love. Uh, let's start from the top here. Uh, let's see. I'm going to move down. There's a lot of Renee adoration in here, so I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> People love them some Renee. Okay, let's see. Um, what was the first good question in here? Moving down. All right, here's one from Nick. So Nick says he would love to know how Renee organizes all the images in that treasure bag for later use. How do you how do you organize your images? Uh, it gives most people anxiety. Um, <laughs> I have I have basically a section for travel, which is basically all the places that I visit to. Then I've got a section for clouds, and I've got a section like basically sections for atmospheric stuff. 
Um, but if I visit the same place twice, then it's the same title. It's like I have everything sorted by country. So like, because I've shot a lot in Scotland, so I've got Scotland, you know, and that's the first part of the folder. And it's just folders. Like it's it's Windows folders. It's not organized in Lightroom or any of that crazy stuff. Um, because I'm always afraid that you know if a computer is going to die, and then I have to go work on a computer that isn't mine, I have to be able to find everything. So I make sure everything is in hard drives that work for everyone. Sorry, yeah. we're getting a phone call here. That's cool. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I make sure that I can find everything that I need to if ever my workstation dies. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the country and then the location of where it is and then the year if I've been there twice. So it'll be like, you know, okay, this is 2015, this is 2018. So then I instantly know, okay, that was shot on a 5D Mark II, this was shot on the 5D Mark III. And you're building that yourself. So you're, you're, yeah. you're manually doing that. That's not some automated process that looks at the metadata and builds a hierarchy. No, no, I don't have anything automated yet. Um, mostly because, like, I've seen what happens when friends of mine lose their computers, uh, and you know, like, let's say a glass of water gets spilled on it and completely fries the whole thing. Their entire organization structure is in really bad shape sometimes, and I'm kind of just afraid of that. Like, I'm always just like, like, nervous enough that I think the entire world's gonna fall apart. So I'm like, what is my worst case scenario, and we plan for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Cool. All right, Nick, thanks for that, uh, that question. Here's another one. Um, this is from Trevor. So Trevor says, there are so many reasons why Capture One is better than Adobe for tethering. It's not even in the same universe. Do you agree with that? Yeah, their tethering is unreal. It is so, so good, yeah. Um, I, I used to, the only reason I had Lightroom back in the day was for tethering, to shoot tethered to the computer. And then Capture One version eight came out, and this was long before I started working with them. And I was like, oh my God, like mind explodey. Oh, this is so amazing. And it was really good. And that was version eight and we're on version 12 now. Yeah. Um, and it's only been getting better and better and better. So yeah, I, like I love the tethering system in Capture One. It's well, here's, awesome. a, here's a follow up to that, to Trevor's question. Thanks Trevor for that. Uh, follow up questions from Eddie Lagos. And Eddie says, Renee, could you recommend some free stuff to learn Capture One or even some stuff you have to pay for? Phase One blog. Where is it? The phase one blog. Oh, the phase one blog. Okay. Yeah. They have like a video thing. Um, like Dave Grover, David Grover does like all these incredible little video snippets. Some of them are only a few minutes long. Some of them are quite long, like half an hour or an hour. Uh, and it's awesome. There is so much information on there and it's completely free. It's really, really, really good. I mean, they sometimes do webinars as well and don't quote me on that, whether they're free or not. I'm sure they are, but it could be misinformed on that. Um, yeah, B Phase One blog. They have a whole video thing, and on YouTube, you can just binge. You can just um, binge you know, and get, from the get guy who knows it all. Yeah, David Grover is is like the man uh, who knows Capture One extremely well and articulates it very well. Nice, nice. All right, Eddie Lagos, thanks for that. Hey, you should have him on here one day. He's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I will, Eddie. Yeah. Contact me. Uh, Troy Miller's in there. He's, he's responding to Eddie. Oh, hey, Sky Swapper. How's it going, Troy? Uh, Eddie, uh, uh, Troy, Troy says Capture One YouTube channel has a lot of great content. They do regular webinars as well. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Right there. Uh, let's see. Let's move on. Lots of questions in here. Lots of Renee love. Everybody loves Renee. What is up with that? That's not, that is a lie, <laughs> but I'm glad that the, the feedback tonight is good. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, commercial photographer. People are saying they love Bridge. Uh, here's one from Ruth. Let's bring Ruth's question up on screen here. So Ruth Hample says, question for Renee, how do you organize and find the photos you take to incorporate into layers? So it's one thing to build those folders. How do you find those shots once, once you've, you've built that hierarchy? Um, honestly, just the digging through and going through the folders is actually good for getting the brain going. So I'll have an idea of like, you know, oh, well, like I wonder, like a castle would be nice. So I just did a composite two days ago. Um, or was it yesterday? I don't remember anymore. Uh, you know, of like this woman in this full suit of armor on top of this horse. Uh, and, and when I photographed it, I was like, oh my God, I want to put some kind of castle something behind it. I don't know what. And so I just started like digging through some of the castle footage that I have. Yeah. And then it turns out that there, I had this photo uh, from when my sister and I and a friend of mine were in Germany of this castle way back on a hill. And I originally had tried putting in stuff closer and I was like, oh, it's too claustrophobic and it doesn't really work. So I just kept like scrolling through until all of a sudden, you know, it's like, ding, there's a thing. 
you know, I, I, I credit kind of like, you know, when you meet somebody, how do you know you're going to be friends? You know, like you walk into a room where you don't know anybody and all of a sudden there's just like this little like pink and you're like, oh, I'm going to try talking to that one. And that's right. kind of what it's like for me when I'm digging through files is I'm like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And my subconscious brain is like way smarter than I am. And it's like, you should pay attention to that file. But there's no, and then I'll try you're, it not, out. you're not using any sort of like metadata or tagging or anything to find the photos no, it's more it should, of it's you don't. you kind of have a, a a gray matter based cataloging system up there right? a rolodex yeah, a Rol that <laughs> sometimes <laughs> deletes files <laughs> the rolodex papers just go flying everywhere sometimes and uh, i don't know where they went yeah you're, it's not the great. renee robin dewey decimal system up there <laughs> oh it's awful <laughs> cool all right thank you for that ruth all right here's a question from uh nick so nick says Question for Renee, for someone interested in getting into compositing for a living, spend some time on personal projects and build a portfolio or seek out gigs for experience. Should they do self projects or should they look for gigs? What do you think? All of the above. Why would it be one or the other? Yeah. I mean, everything's gonna give you experience. Um, whether you wanna do it full time or not isn't really, it isn't always up to you. I mean, it is up to you, but it also isn't up to you. Yeah. You know, maybe you live in an area where that kind of work is really challenging or, um, you know, your, your personality doesn't translate well online. So people don't really want to interact with you or maybe it does. And it's mm -hmm. awesome. There's so many variables into doing like, you know, all this stuff for a living that are sometimes not always in your control. So you can just do your best to be prepared to show up, which means creating a gigantic body of work and working at it all the time. Yeah. But, at the end of the day, you're an entrepreneur with a service. So you have to have a good service and then you have to be able to run a good business. Yeah. So it's it's so much more than just like, oh, I'm good at composites. Well, congratulations. There's a kid in Brazil who's 14 years old who's 100 times better than you are. How are you going to beat them? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, my God. There's this, there's this kid, Mario OM. He's in, he's in South America. And I saw his work and he's so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I sent him an email and I was just like, dude, you, <laughs> I am terrified of you in five years. Like... You know, he's already just killing it. He's so, so good. And yeah. I'm so excited to see where he where he comes from. Sorry, I just hit the table. Um, but, I mean, your your competition is the entire planet. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Which, so, which I mean, which makes everybody better, right? So, you gotta... I love it. I think it's great. I'm super excited to be expired. I'm, I'm excited to be able to, like, not keep up with the industry anymore because of what the quality of work is going to be. I think it's amazing. I like that. I'm going to use that quote. I'm excited to be expired. That's, uh... Yeah. I mean, I'm going to have to figure out how to pay my bills again, but I figure by then I'll be tired of it anyway. Well, you'll expire. <laughs> well, this you will expire, and you'll, like, you know reinvent like a moth right yeah, so. yeah well yeah like a moth like a dirty <laughs> dusty bapping against the light bulb moth. annoying people that are trying to have yeah uh, exactly okay cool nick thanks for that uh here's another one from uh tech shaman hey tech shaman look at that so tech shaman says uh would love to know if she might try using the new ipad pro with photoshop for ios you know adobe's about to release photoshop on the new 2018 iPads, would you incorporate that into your workflow? So I know people who are doing that and that sucks um, because there there's no real external storage device, easy access stuff going on. I mean, yeah. a girlfriend of mine, she does, she did exactly that. She's got a big workstation. She went to the iPad and she's so excited. She's like, oh my God, I can't wait to do everything on the iPad and I'm never ever using my laptop ever again until she has to load everything onto the cloud and then download the stuff off of the cloud to work on the iPad Pro. And then it's just like that kind of a backlog yeah. being bandwidth would make me absolutely nuts. I would hate that. So is the iPad Pro amazing and extremely like, you know, if efficient once the stuff is on there? I think so. Yeah. Um, but I also run into the problems of which part of the reason why my computers are so big is cooling. Right. Sure, processors can handle the work all day long and the technology inside, but you've got to keep it cold. So what I'm yeah. going to do, sit it on a fan, like then it's just your back. <laughs> a block to of it. ice. <laughs> well, yeah, you don't do that. But I mean, like, you know, you still have to be able to keep it cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wonder, um, I wonder if an iPad, I have an iPad. I have a, one of the new ones, uh, the 256 gig 11 inch. And I wonder, could, I want to stress test it when Photoshop comes out. And I wonder, can it handle that kind of stuff? Like, can it handle you know, multi-dozen layer Photoshop images. And, and can it handle it for eight hours a day? And it can't handle it long term, yeah. Or will it, will it melt and leave a mark on my lap or something, you know? 
yeah uh, well exactly so like those are those are the questions that aren't quite answered yet um yeah. and i mean it would be great i would absolutely love to not have to carry around a super heavy yeah. laptop all the time yeah. i would be right i don't carry this thing around because i like it and because it's like this cross i want to bear like absolutely make this stuff paperweight <laughs> yeah some quantum crap that goes into this stuff like make it happen i don't want to carry the weight oh that would be so killer like if 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 someone like you is able to create the work like you create on a on a device like an iPad and and do it without many compromises that's just magic that, that's that's when we're in that no compromise zone there because it that changes even i would argue that changes architecture of buildings in ways like you know you you look at how flat screen changed flat screen televisions changed how houses are designed you know there's no more like nooks to put the big sony wega in there you know it's like put them yeah. on the wall yeah i think stuff like that happens and all, home offices change all kinds of changes happen so yeah, yeah like one of the things i noticed when i was working on the wacom though is so with the ipad you're going to run into the same problems you still need a keyboard I mean, yeah. I don't know about how other people create, but like I have my entire keyboard completely remapped to like a whole bunch of shortcuts. And with the Wacom, there's like six buttons on the side. And I'm always like, oh crap, which button was that? And I like push them all. And then like Photoshop, there's like a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm like, no, I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Which button was controlled? Um, so it was really slows me down. And so the iPad had run into the same problem. Of course, you just get a Bluetooth keyboard. But then once again, you're just like, you're, back to multiple devices you're adding weight so on and so forth so it depends on your workflow yeah i mean if you can make an ipad pro work for you absolutely do it i can't wait for the technology to be lightweight for me to be it's able to coming. Do it. it's absolutely coming all yeah, right here, here's it. here's a question from aj porter aj porter says ask her if she would marry an irishman <laughs> <laughs> there would be explosive fights and probably deaths probably not a good idea <laughs> All right, AJ, I'm, I'm guessing that's a no. All right, so David, <laughs> David, Perry, David Perry says, what's the best way to source high-quality background, image, uh, background images? A lot of stock photography is already heavily color graded, making the composite with your own images less flexible. What do you, what do you say to that? Yeah, that part sucks. That's why I shoot my own. Um, the other option that you could do uh, as far as like best is not going to be the most time efficient. But a good way to do that is to uh, make friends with photographers around the world who shoot landscapes mm -hmm. and be like, hey, I'm looking for something like this. Do you have any raw files? Like, kick you some pocket change. I mean, if you're going to be paying for stock files anyways, um, it might be a good way to get yourself some raw files that are useful. Or even just, like, track down the photographer who shot it, you know, on the stock website, which I'm sure breaches some contract agreement somewhere. But... <laughs> Um, you know, you might not be able to get the same image because, of course, those images belong to whatever agency is selling them. Yeah. But they might have other stuff or they might be able to go back out there and photograph some stuff for you. So it just might involve thinking outside the box a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. All right, David. Thanks for that. Uh, here's a, a comment from Tammy Wallace. Not a question. She says, hello. No questions. Just happy to see you happy and working. The website is stunning. Look at oh. that. See? There are That's nice people in the world. Look at that. There's a lot of nice people in the world. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Here's another question. Uh, I think this one's from Trevor. Let's see what Trevor says. He says, this week in photo, is there something about telephoto lens work that's conducive to compositing work? I've seen a lot of uh, mid to telephoto composite pieces and they seem to be con the, or mid to telephoto composite pieces and they seem to be quite strong. When you're, when you're shooting your pieces of your composites, Renee, are you shooting them in telephoto or is there, do you lean towards that? Any reason for that? All of the above. I mean, all of it always depends on who I'm shooting and what it's for. Yeah. Um, sorry, another phone call. <laughs> no, it's okay. You're good. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I like doing some composites that are telephoto. I mean, I find that your how blurry stuff gets your depth of field is, is way more crunchy. So sometimes it's easier to composite stuff that is, you know, that compression. Yeah. Um, but then also the wide angle stuff I think is really nice too, but it is a little bit more picky. So, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, why would somebody choose to do digital painting over analog painting? Yeah. Yeah. Cause what, what you it, like to it do. depends. It's all, it depends. Right. Yeah, there, I hate saying that there's like, this is the way. Yeah. I'm not that person to well, say that answer. It's art, and you know, there is no one right way. 
Uh, okay, here's one from Lord Huey. Lord Huey says... Oh, the Lord Huey. I know Lord that Huey. name. He says, how do you decide how and what sceneries to take for composites? I just shoot everything. I'm, I'm like Pokemon. Gotta catch them Reckless all. abandon, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm just like, I'm somewhere that lights up the synapses in my brain, and I'm just like, woo, this is awesome! Yeah. And then I just like photograph a bunch of it, and then I like maybe don't use it ever, or maybe I do... Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I have a specific style. I mean, I know what I like, yeah. which helps. Like, but if you're walking around, like, the hard part is predicting future brain me because it was like current brain me, which was like four years ago, where current brain me is like, I like this. But what happens if I shoot it like this and then I don't use those files for four years? And then now, when I'm reworking all the work and I'm like, oh my God, I wonder if, yes, I did shoot it differently. And I'm so excited that I have this file. Or other times where I'm just like, no, I should have done that. I know I was thinking about it, and I didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Pokemon, man. Got to catch them all. All right, Lord Huey, Huey thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Richard uh, Pochop says, what's your favorite mobile app in photography? I don't use them. I you have don't Instagram. use mobile? I, I for sure thought you were going to say Snapseed. You love Snapseed. Nope. No, I don't use any of them. Um, I used Mextures for a little while, but... I mean, my iPhone is, is literally for taking pictures of strangers' cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't really post it anywhere else for me. <laughs> All right. I like look- people's dogs. <laughs> I'm looking for new questions. I think that's it. I think we got them all. Yeah, I think nice. we got them all. Okay. Nice. Very good. Well, thanks, Actually, everybody, think- <laughs> for your questions. Uh, we ran a little bit over, but uh, that was good. So, Renee, any any final thoughts? I mean, we covered we covered sort of the you know, a little bit of your workflow. I know you got lots of stuff online that people can go check out anyway. We talked mm-hmm. about a little bit of the Photoshop workflow. We talked about your Capture One. We talked about the, the output and sharing on Smug Mug. Anything else you want to add, you know, in terms of, of how Renee Robin does her thing? I mean, just diversify your study yeah. more than anything. Yeah. Um, if you're If you're interested in one thing, then try learning other things and see how you can apply it to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that, that's it's interesting. Like when I look when I look at your work, it's it's both inspiring and um, intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. You should see the work that I look up to, though. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. All right, yeah, here, here's good. another. Here's one more question from Nick, and we'll we'll. This yeah. is a perfect up, one Nick? to end it on. Uh, let perfect. me bring it on screen here. So Nick says, uh, "How do you know when you're done with an image?" <laughs> um. How do you know when you're done a fight <laughs> when there's no clear winner? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you just get tired of fighting. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's back to that relationship analogy, right? <laughs> oh my god, but that's like totally how it is for me. Um, you know, like when I how I know when I'm done is sometimes it's a logical decision, sometimes it's my left brain being like, "Oh, A B C D equals E." Yeah. And we have arrived and that's exactly what we need. And then there's the other times where I'm like, "I'm just feeling this one out." And then it takes forever because I'm like running on my feelings and they're not to be trusted. Um <laughs> and then, you know, it turns into the thing where I look at it and I'm just like, "I'm tired of looking at it. I think it looks okay. I think it feels okay. Maybe I've been staring at it for too long." Yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's so different for everyone. There's no point where the image says, "I'm done. You're finished." Some, well, sometimes it happens. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sometimes you like work on it, and it's just like, "Bing," you know. It's, you've walked into a room and you found your new best friend, you know, and yeah. you're just like, "Oh my god, we're gonna have the best friendship ever. This is gonna be amazing." Yeah. And then sometimes that's what that's like, and then other times it's not. <laughs> Love, it. Love it. Well, Renee, Renee Robin, thank you so much for your time tonight. This is perfect you did a great job fantastic thanks for having me thanks for the questions guys super appreciate everyone checking in yeah those are great questions those are really great questions what a great audience um what uh if people want to you know renee robin photography.com right that's the, mm-hmm. that's the url renee robin photography.com if you want to check out renee's work any other places where you'd like people to go to to connect or otherwise stay in touch with you I mean, well, there's like, you know, the, the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook, there's all those kinds of things. Um, those are like the, the, the big ones. Those are the ones I'm most active on. Um, I've completely forgotten my login for Flickr. So if you search that, you're going to see work that's like seven years old. <laughs> are you <laughs> coming no back? Are you get, now, that, now that Smug Mug has reinvigorated Flickr, are you going to come back? Uh, maybe. I was never really big on Flickr, though, ever. Yeah. I never really used it. Um, I kind of just like chose the things I wanted to and like shut the doors to everything else. But 
Um, I mean, if there's a good photo community that allows nipples that isn't going to get like you know accounts shut down then all right flicker we can play nice <laughs> yeah yeah well that, you know, good luck with that, that shit. <laughs> good luck with that because you know that's yeah. uh, you know, even when we do our uh, our photo critiques on this week in photo it's not even it's not it's i mean we like, we do them and they get posted to twip but they also go into the U the twip youtube channel and you know i don't want to censor people so i don't want them to not post photos but the group is so awesome they will censor themselves and put the little black tape over nipples or whatever you know so that yeah. we i mean Double and i appreciate that because we're sending you to hell yeah i mean otherwise we'll get, i mean all morals <laughs> and, and whatever aside that if youtube will block you and give you an yeah. explicit and all that stuff so yeah it's it's sad but it is what it is it's what we live it's in a pony show for now yeah all right renee robin thank you so much for your time tonight we'll see uh hopefully i'll see you in vegas at wppi right yeah, I'd like to be there. That's the plan so far. Um, I have I missed New York a couple of years in a row, but I haven't missed a WPPI yet in a few years. So we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. And thanks, everyone, for showing up in the chat. I appreciate you. Yeah. And if you want to uh, keep up with all things This Week in Photo, obviously, you can head over to thisweekinphoto.com uh, or go to thisweekinphoto.com slash subscribe and subscribe to our podcasts, etc. Give us a thumbs up. You can like us on, on YouTube to make sure that we keep the lights on around here and keep this green screen behind me going. So, <laughs> all right, folks, it is time to take that lens cap off. This is Twitter.